I would be back again. I appreciate the opportunity always to come and minister the word up here in Canada. And uh, with Bridalwood, I believe it was the first assembly that invited us to come up and uh, certainly appreciate the encouragement from the saints in this area, not just Bridalwood, but other assemblies as well. And so it's uh, good to be here. Uh, my wife, Cindy, is with me this trip and my son, James, one of our four children, he's with us as well. And so we're glad to be up on such a beautiful day, as Brother Sam mentioned. Beautiful weather. Why didn't you bring the heat with you? I don't know why. It's true. It's warmer down there, I think. So we'll have an opportunity sometime in the future to experience that. Well, also, I want to mention, uh, as was already announced, uh, Know the Word Ministries has been going on since 1995, and we organized it as a ministry to encourage the Lord's people. The Lord's people certainly need encouragement. They need solid Bible teaching as well, and so we like to organize conferences and special events, as was mentioned, and invite the best of speakers to come and minister uh, to the Lord's people through these events, conferences. Some of you have come and experienced some of those conferences. We have one uh, each year in September called uh, RV Cedars Bible Conference. That's down by the Jersey Shore. We call it the Bible Conference on the Bay, and uh, we'd love to have you come. I don't know if you're watching some of these slides, but uh, we have some commercials on that, but we're not going to go through that this evening. But uh, those events are take place on a regular basis. We've been doing now th this for about 30 years, and uh, we would encourage people to come on down to the Jersey Shore. We do a lot of these events. These bring the Lord's people together in times of fellowship, and then, of course, when there are Bible conferences and Bible teaching as well. So we want to encourage you to go to our website. It's knowtheword.com. That was announced, knowtheword.com, and you can see the various events we do under the events uh, tab. Also on the table just uh, below me here are some of the literature pieces that we also produce. These are gospel tracts and Bible teaching tracts, and so you're welcome to take as many as you can uh, effectively use. They're like our salvation, free. So you can take them and enjoy them and use them as you would like. Now, please open your Bibles to Zechariah chapter three for a message or a second message. Thank you, Brother Sam, for your ministry. Genesis chapter one and all the practical applications as well as the doctrinal foundation. You know, if you're solid in the book of Genesis, you're gonna be solid in the scriptures and in the doctrines of the faith. And Sam, you did a really excellent job of analyzing that for us. So thank you so much for your ministry. Sam and I have the privilege of seeing each other once in a while on Bible study, on Zoom Bible studies. And so uh, we have gotten to know uh, each other a little bit better through those events. Zechariah chapter three, beginning of verse one. That's not an easy book to find. I can still hear the pages rippling in the audience here. So it's toward the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter three, beginning of verse one. Then he showed me, an angel showed Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at uh, his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Verse three. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he, the Lord, answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you. I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua. Your version may say protested. It means the same thing. It is admonished. Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. If you will walk in my ways, if you will keep my command, then you also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you. For they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts. And I'll remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. 
Well, this evening, I would like to talk about the redeeming work of the Lord, the restoring work of the Lord. It's a wonderful theme in scripture. We see so many different people wonderfully transformed through the power of Christ. That's the power of the cross. That's what we emphasize. This is what uh, in the Christian world is called Good Friday. Good for us, horrible for our Savior, bittersweet, we might say, because it says in Hebrews chapter 12, for the joy that was set before him. Isaiah chapter 53 says he shall see his seed, his offspring, spiritual offspring. And so there was indeed a joy that was set before him, but what suffering our Savior went through for you and for me. It's Good Friday for us. And we emphasize that, but it's the power of the cross is what we see because there in Luke chapter 23, when you see the Lord Jesus hanging on the cross, there are seven different types of people surrounding that cross. It's a cross section of all humanity, representative of all humanity, all through the ages. There were the people that stood beholden. There were the rulers who derided him. There were the uh, soldiers who mocked him and uh, gambled for his garments. There, were the, there was the centurion who said, surely this is a righteous man. There were those who stood afar off. There were those who stood nearby. All these different types of people around the cross. And the Lord Jesus was there dying on the cross for them, for you and for me, representative of all those people around the cross. And so uh, it is the power of the cross. And here in this portion of God's word, we see a wonderful picture of how God's going to restore the nation of Israel. Primarily, the application of this chapter here, chapter three, is God's reinstatement of the high priest Joshua, not the guy that went around the walls of Jericho, but Joshua, the high priest in the day here of Zechariah and reinstating him into the priesthood. Wonderful picture how God did that cleansing work, that redeeming work. It's also a wonderful picture of how he will do that in the future. Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 tell a wonderful story of how God's going to bring the nation of Israel around, his people whom he loves, and he's going to make them come to himself. And so it's a great story, great story of redemption. The whole scripture is a straight great story of redemption. So we have that wonderful grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ highlighted in so many different places. And in this chapter in particular, you see a wonderful picture of how God does that wonderful truth, how God that, that does that in the nation of Israel. But beyond that, what I like to look at, what we like to emphasize even in these pieces of literature below, is the practical encouragement that it gives you and me how God can indeed redeem someone who is lost, who's a sinner, great gospel picture right here in Zechariah chapter three, but also how God can restore someone to himself who already knows him. So it's a great lesson in the gospel for the sinner, a great lesson for the saint who needs to be restored. How many people in the scriptures can we think of who needed to be restored? I think of course, Peter, he was certainly one of them, on this particular weekend, we think of Peter. Uh, you know, he, the Lord Jesus appeared to Peter, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we don't know what time of day it was. Maybe it was in the afternoon. Remember, Peter went with the other people to the other disciples to the uh, tomb and he slowed up. I imagine John, who is a fast runner, faster than Peter that moment. I imagine Peter running to the tomb, all of a sudden slacking off and said to himself, why am I running so fast? I, I uh, denied the Lord when I shouldn't have. And so he slacked off. But later it says that the Lord Jesus appeared to Cephas, 1 Corinthians 15. And there was a private restoration that was taking place right there. We don't have a record of it in scripture, but we know in John's gospel, at the end, chapter 21, he was wonderfully restored in the presence of his peers the wonderful restoration that took place with the Lord Jesus, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, you know the portion of scripture. And so God is in a business of restoring his people. And so I don't know everyone in this audience, whether it's young or old alike, maybe you need a special touch from the Lord. Maybe you need to be restored back to him again. You might be here in this audience in a nice service, good music, comfortable surroundings, and still need to be restored to the Lord. This is a great portion of scripture that reminds us what God does and how he does it in the lives of his people. But maybe you're here also because statistically, there could easily be 
someone, some people in this very audience who don't know the Savior, who may be going through the motions, as we call it. You might be dressed up looking nice and presentable, and you might be smiling and everything else, but your heart is far from him. You know, if you've seen that track, I'm sure it says how you can miss heaven by 18 inches. You've seen that, right? That distance between the head and the heart. And it's easy for people to have head knowledge of the things of God and not really have the heart knowledge. And so it requires a bowing before the Lord. It requires a divine cleansing. It uh, requires forgiveness from the Lord as we approach him and ask for his forgiveness. So it's a great picture here. Not only a picture of how God regenerates, restores, but also uh, regenerates, but also restores. So I'd like to take a look at some of these details. Now I have my clicker right here. And so uh, I have been admonished how I need to make sure I don't click too quick or too slow. But you know, one thing that stands out here, right, is there's standing room only. Do you notice how many people are standing in this portion? Did you catch that in the reading of this? Well, first off, there is Joshua in verse 1. He's standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, the angel of the Lord is an Old Testament appearance of Christ. It's a wonderful story, wonderful series to study the Old Testament appearances of Christ. The angel of the Lord that we see, capital A in the scriptures here. It's the work of Christ in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord disappears, you know, in the New Testament. You don't see him in the New Testament, but you see him all throughout the Old Testament. So it's Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, verse 1. Then the next thing we see is Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So that's another person that's standing. And then we see another one, angels. The angels in verse 4 and in verse 7, cited twice, that the angels, those that were there, uh, along with uh, these other personalities, those that stood before him, it's identified there in verse four, they're standing, but it doesn't finish. There's still another one, the angel of the Lord, it says in verse five, he stood by waiting to see what would become of Joshua. That's another person that's standing. And then depending upon how you interpret the verse in verse seven, there are the companions who stand here. It could be a reference to the angels, the angels that were there, or it could be his peers. Joshua's peers. But regardless, there's a lot of standing taking place. And each one of these references has a wealth of Bible instruction and information for us to examine and to apply to our personal lives. I'm not up here to quote the Bible verses, nor is Brother Sam, and just to give you a, a flood of information. Uh, we want the Spirit of God to challenge us and to change us. We don't want just the academic exercise. We want hearts changed for the Savior. And when we open the scriptures, every time you open that word of God, you need to be asking yourself, Lord, speak to me. Thy servant heareth, like Samuel uh, exclaimed. And that should be the attitude of our heart. Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, when he was there waiting for Peter to come from a distance, remember he discharged his servants to go find Peter. Peter was in Joppa. He had just had the vision of the sheet that came down from heaven with all the clean and unclean animals on it. When Peter was led back to the home of Cornelius, there was Cornelius with a, peop a number of people standing with him. And he said, we are here to hear what God has to say to you, uh, through, uh, to, from you to us. And that should be the attitude of every person's heart. The word of God is opened up. The scriptures are proclaimed. What is God saying to me. Don't worry about your neighbor. Uh, ask what the Lord wants to say to you. Well, what, what does the Lord want to say to us from this portion? Well, again, this is a, a, a filled and fraught with so many lessons. The first one, of course, is Joshua. Joshua is standing. And in verse 1, it says it very clearly right here. Let's read it again. Verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, what was uh, Joshua doing here, standing before the angel of the Lord? Now, we don't know because the scripture is not uh, is silent on what the wording was. But I imagine that Joshua, the high priest, was standing there making a request to have access into the presence of the Lord. That's what I get the sense is happening here in Joshua's experience. 
He wanted to come into the presence of the Lord. He wanted to serve. But there was somebody preventing that. We'll look at that in just a moment. And maybe there are people that want to have a relationship with the Lord, and they think that all I have to do is do good works, be the right type of person, perhaps come from the right type of family, have the right type of education, not commit any crime or anything like that. That's a limited view of sin, incidentally. And they think, well, if as long as I didn't hurt anybody, didn't kill anybody, I'm, uh, I'm qualified for heaven. Some people think that way. You may not think that way. Maybe you're a believer. You may not think that, but there's a whole lot of people out in the world that think that way. I keep the Ten Commandments. I do good. I'm a good provider for my family and all the rest. And you think that's going to make them so that when they die, they'll go to heaven. Everybody goes to heaven in that thinking. And of course, that's not what the scripture teaches. Here, Joshua is wanting to stand before the presence of the Lord, but he's being blocked. There is a resistance taking place. And he might have been perfectly uh, equipped, uh, if, if you will, with his requirements, whatever it might be. Uh, he might have thought he was qualified to be in the presence of God, but he wasn't. Because the scripture teaches that unless we're made fit by the Lord himself, Colossians chapter 1, made fit to be partakers of the saints of the inheritance and in light. Unless we're fit to be in the presence of God, we could never, ever access his presence. So it says, he showed me, Joshua, thy priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And, you know, I can't help but connect these verses to Philippians chapter 3, when the Apostle Paul was going through and admonishing the Philippians. He goes through, he says, we're not like the rest of the world. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. We are those who uh, have the Spirit. He says that in Philippians chapter 3, and we rejoice in Christ Jesus. He says, if anybody had any reason to boast, as if they were able to enter into the presence of God, I'm more. And in a sense, I worked in personnel when I was in secular employment. Uh, people like to impress you with their resumes. And so Paul would say this. He'd say, take a look at my spiritual resume. Take a look at my achievements. He, uh, he rolls out his spiritual qualifications. He says, I was of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. That means his parents were both Jews. He gives seven different qualifications as to what would qualify him in his estimation and most people's estimation to come into the very presence of God. He says as concerning, and he's got three concerning phrases there, concerning uh, persecution. He says, I was zealous. I persecuted the church. He had all these different qualifications as to why he should be in there. Four were natural, what he was born into. He had nothing to do with it. Three were acquired. Blameless, it's touching the law, I was blameless, he said. I kept all these things. But what was gained in me, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, indeed, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. There's nothing greater in life than to make sure that you have a relationship with the Lord, with the one who created the universe and you know him personally. That you don't have to make an idol like Paul told the Athenians there in Acts chapter 17, to the unknown God, you, and he said to them, you who you ignorantly worship, him I declare to you. Boy, that had to take a lot of bravado on the part of Paul, didn't it? To stand in front of all these people that were there, the Athenians that were there, and the others, philosophers, Stoics, the Epicureans, all these, there was a crowd there at Mars Hill. We've been to Mars Hill. We've done these trips there to Israel, and of course to Greece on the way to Israel. It's an impressive sight. Parthenon in the background. Parthenon is an impressive building behind there. All that would be part of that pantheon of gods, you know, in Greek mythology. And Paul would, with bravado, with true courage, would say, you who are looking and worshiping these idols, I declare him to you. And he goes right down all by himself. What a man to follow in terms of an example. Standing up and speaking for the Lord, for Christ. And so Paul would be thinking this. He says, in my former days, I did things in good conscience. Acts 23 tells us that he, he lived his life in good conscience, even though he was separated from God. He thought he was qualified. 
to enter God's presence, but he wasn't. He was unfit. Joshua here was unfit. He needed cleansing. He needed something to make him qualified. And the person who is the person on the street, just as much as Joshua here, needs to be cleansed and washed by Christ. And that's why we read Titus chapter 3. We have the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so if you are here this evening, and some of these things you're trying to sort out and say, what does this mean? What does that mean? Let me make it to you abundantly clear. In order to get to heaven, you need to be perfect. You say, perfect? How can I be perfect? Well, you can. You just come to Christ. We heard the words of that song by Augustus Top Lady, and I'm sure you know the story behind it. He was in England, and uh, he, the storm was coming on, and uh, he needed some protection, and so he went into a cleft of the rock. And he felt so secure. As the storm came, the lightning came, he was uh, covered by that rock and he felt safe. And he said, oh, rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. He was safe. And that's what you need as well. So if you're outside of Christ, come to him. Even tonight, trust the Lord Jesus as your savior. But you know, it's not only a great picture here of uh, regeneration. That means coming to Christ for the first time. It's a wonderful picture of restoration. As I mentioned, it uh, pictures here Joshua representing Israel in the day of Zechariah, a near time uh, fulfillment of this truth that needed to take place for him to be cleansed. It's a great picture in the future how Israel will be restored. And it's a great picture how you and I can be restored in Christ. I mentioned Peter, John Mark, others need to be restored, even Thomas. This is the weekend when we're reminded the resurrection of Christ. You remember we talked about eight days later, Thomas, he needed to be restored. He was the doubting Thomas. Remember Thomas? Thomas was the one who said, Lord, I'll go with you wherever you, you go. I'll die with you. That's Thomas in John chapter seven. By the time the resurrection Sunday came around, before he understood, Thomas understood about the resurrection. He was doubting every, unless I see his, I don't, you know, he became almost cynical. Some Christians are like that. You know, you come to know the Lord early on. Things are great. You get hit here, get hit there with things in life. Somebody steps on your toes. Somebody hurts you, whatever it might be. Fellow believers have a number of instances like that down through the years. You're Christian for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It starts adding up. You get resentful. And so you can say, enough of this. Maybe you need a touch from the Lord like Thomas did, being very doubtful about things about Christ, about the Christian life. And so Thomas needed to be restored. Well, Joshua here is standing before the angel of the Lord, and he wants to come into the presence of God, but he needs to be fit. But as we mentioned already, there's somebody standing in his way. And that's somebody is Satan, a very real personality. One time I heard on Jeopardy, you know, Jeopardy, do, 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 right? You know, Jeopardy. We all know Jeopardy. All right. Question. The fictitious adversary in the Bible. Fictitious adversary in the Bible. And the right answer said the wrong way was Satan. He's hardly fictitious. But that's what he would love to do. Have people think that he's just, you know, represents evil or something like that, but he's very real. And so here it is, standing to resist, Satan standing to resist. Here is Joshua wanting to come into the presence of the Lord, it seems, to have access to be useful for God's service, but there's a block, there's a hindrance, and this is the hindrance right here. Paul would write about this in his ministry. We desire to go here, but Satan hindered us. He's always there to hinder. One area that he's there to hinder is for salvation. He's like second, what it says in 2 Samuel, you see the reference up on the screen, 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse two, in your spare time, take a look at the account of Absalom. Very interesting reading, 2 Samuel chapter 15. The previous chapter says that Absalom was a handsome guy. He was every mother's dream for their daughter. 
handsome guy, thick hair. They said at the end of the year, they cut his hair. It was a couple pounds, something to that effect. He was a handsome dude, <laughs> as we would say. And uh, he was the son of David. And he was uh, influential. And it says in chapter 15 of 2 Samuel, and especially verses 1 and 2, that he made chariots and horses to go before him. He had, he had resources. And he went there and he would bend his ear down and listen at the gates. And he would listen to people's complaints. And he said, you know, he, they said, we have a lawsuit. We want to bring a lawsuit. And if so I wish there was somebody, people would complain. Say, I wish there was somebody here to hear our case. Absalom would hear that early in the day. And he would say, if I were made deputy in the land, I would give your servant, he calls himself their servant, he would give you what you needed. And it says in that portion, verse six, and especially, he says, by this means, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. That is a clear picture of the strategy of the enemy. Getting up early, that's what uh, he was. He was up early. Absalom was to listen to the complaints, listen what people wanted, and make them promises, take them down a garden path. And that's what Satan does as well. He's up early. He's after people early in life. When they're young in life, he wants to take you, young people here, he wants to take you down a different path. You get involved in all sorts of activities, pleasures, earning money, making money. Love to take your heart away from the things of the Lord and distract you into wrong things, get you entangled, put a handle on you. And when you start to move ahead, of the Lord, he'll grab that handle and say, where do you think you're going? That handle can last for years. I've talked in uh, my own ministry with chaplains who have dealt with men after 50, 60, 70 years weeping uh, at the end of their life for the things that they'd done when they were teens, regrets that they had in life. Satan works that way. He's the accuser of the brethren, it says who accused them in Revelation 12, 1, accused them before our God day and night. Satan here is to resist trying to keep Joshua from moving ahead and progressing in the things of the Lord. And Satan is there to stand, blocking the path, accusing us, throwing his fiery darts at us, right at the blessed breastplate, things that hurt us, Find us of our failures, captured in the Pilgrim's Progress, Bunyan's great work, Pilgrim Progress, the, the castle of doubt, or saying, I want to do things for the Lord. And that booming voice comes out, you fail, your king. You have no right. That's the accuser, the brother. He wants to keep you at bay. He wants to keep you from moving ahead, from entering your inheritance. The children of Israel, they needed to enter their inheritance. They had to go through the Jordan River. They had to go down into the Jordan River, follow that Ark of the Covenant, perfect picture of Christ. And that Ark of the Covenant, you know, is wooden, overlaid with gold. The humanity and deity of Christ pictured beautifully there. Going down into the rivers of the Jordan, coming up the other side, the death and resurrection of Christ, identifying with him. That's the way to enter in our, our inheritance. That's what Joshua and the children of Israel did. That's what we need to do. But there is someone standing in the way, keeping us from progressing, from moving ahead. And this is the picture that we see here. So what's the remedy for it? We'd be most helpful. Uh, most, uh, it would be most helpful for the Lord, I should say, is what I'm trying to say. And, uh, and it's hurtful when we see when people give into this. What did Martin Luther say in his end? If not the right man were on our side, our winning would be losing. I think that's the phraseology. And so here is Joshua. He is helpless in himself. He's hopeless in himself. And so are we. If not the right man were on our side. Christ Jesus, it is him. 
And here it is, the angel of the Lord. And so what do we see in the next movement right here? Of course, this portion of Absalom, we explained that before, but Absalom, I want to go just for a second. He was there, he was at it early, he was speaking lies and he was stealing hearts, which is what Satan, the strategy of the enemy is all about. Well, what do we see in the next movement here in this portion? Well, the angel of the Lord standing there to rebuke. You got Joshua wanting to come in, desiring to come into the presence of the Lord to be used, perhaps in useful service. Satan standing to resist, but the angel of the Lord standing also to rebuke. And so we see it here in verse three, Joshua's clothed with filthy garments, was standing before the angel, then he, the angel of the Lord, answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, see, I will remove your iniquity from you. I will clothe you with, clothe you with rich robes. What a great story right here. What a great work that is done. Joshua could have said, not me, I'm well dressed like the rich young ruler. What must I do to gain eternal life? That was a facade. You ever, you ever have talked to somebody who asks a question, you know that they know the answer, but they're making it like they don't know the answer? That's the rich young ruler. What must I do to gain eternal life? Okay, take your riches, sell what you have, give to the poor. You know, what, what does the law say? First, before that, what was the law? Say? Well, do all this, do that. Oh, I've kept these from my youth up. Okay, here's one more thing you lack. The Lord put his finger right on the problem with that particular man. So the angel of the Lord knows what to do. Joshua knew what to do. Joshua, right? I mean, I can't quote the words exactly from the hymn that Brother Sam put up there. Naked I came to thee for dress, right? That was the phrase. That's what I was capturing as I saw those words up there. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Joshua had to say, Lord, I can't do it. I need your help. And if anything, it was just that Joshua presented himself and says, I need your help. He could have easily said, I'll do it on my own. In Exodus chapter 29, you look it up, Exodus chapter 29, when the priests were consecrated, the first thing they had to do is be stripped of their garments and have new clothes put on. They were washed first. And after they were washed, then they were anointed. It's a beautiful picture of what happens when a person comes to Christ. Their clothes, perhaps of self-righteousness, the fig leaves that Adam had, and anybody like Paul, Saul of Tarsus, had all these great credentials, spiritually speaking, religiously speaking, great credentials. All those he counted as refuse, that he might win Christ. All those had to be taken away and be clothed with the righteousness of Christ and the robes that he gives, rich robes. And so it is the, the rebuke of the Lord against Satan and the work of God, work of Christ in making available, making people fit who come to him for dress, to come to him for acceptance, not in their own strength, not in their character, not in their pride, not in any of these things, but simply coming to the Lord and saying, I need your help. I need you, Lord. That's the attitude that Joshua presented. No question. He didn't fight against it at all. And so God says to him through this, to the angel of the Lord says, I have removed your iniquity from you. I will clothe you with rich robes. And we see that all the way through the scriptures, don't we? You know, in Genesis chapter 28 and verse 16, we have the account of Jacob. And Jacob was on the run because of what he did with his brother. You know the whole story, chapters before bargained for his birthright, you know, stole the blessing, all the rest. He's on, his, on the run. He goes to sleep, takes a rock for the pillow, sleeps. And in that sleep, he sees that ladder vision of these angels ascending and descending upon it with the message from the Lord. And so he is there. And when he wakes up, he says, surely God is in this place and I knew it not. That's why he called the place Bethel, house of God. Dave Boyer, some of you might recognize that name from a former generation. He's kind of like the Frank Sinatra of the Christian world. 
Right? He's in the 90s right now, he's still singing. Some of you may not even know who I'm talking about. But, you know, when he was a young fellow, there was two places to go if you want to make it big in, this, in the Hollywood scene or whatever. It was during the days of Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin and all these guys, the Rat Pack. And, you know, either you went to Las Vegas or you went to Atlantic City. Well, well Dave Boyer came from a pastor's family. He was, in a, he was in a denominational church from York, Pennsylvania. He said, I'm going to make it big in Atlantic City. He was not a believer, and yet he was a son of a minister of the gospel. And he went off to Atlantic City, and he made it big. His, he took a stage name of Joey. Joey, I forget the last name, but Joey. And made it big. Here is this 19-year-old star singing the songs and bumping shoulders with all these great singers of the 60s. And yet he was empty inside. And he was on drugs, he was on amphetamines, he was on alcohol, and his life was falling apart. So one day he says, I got to get back home. I need Christ as my savior. And in a club down there, it's called the 500 Club. There's plaques still in Atlantic City. We've seen them along the street owned by someone who was a racketeer. And in front of a whole crowd, much larger than this crowd, Dave Boyer stood in front of that whole crowd and he sang this song, Calvary covers it all. My sin and disgrace, Calvary covers it all. He said afterwards, given this testimony, you could hear a pin drop. Can you imagine this? This was the crowd where certain type of individuals wore sunglasses when it was dark. Get the picture? And he sang up there, testifying the Lord, came to know Christ. One of his favorite songs, you were there all the time, waiting patiently in line. You were there, God, all the time. And God was there all the time. And for Jacob, he was there all the time. Surely God is in this place, and I knew it not. And so he presented himself to the Lord. And the Lord receives any who come to him. And that's what we see here with Joshua in picture. Yes, there was this Joshua I priest. Yes, it applies primarily to the nation of Israel. Yes, to all these things, but a wonderful gospel picture and a picture of restoration, how God restores a person to himself. God says in his word, I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. He says, I'll make the glory of the latter house to be greater than the former. I'll give you beauty for ashes. Wonderful verses of restoration of four believers. We're not talking about the sinner. We're talking about the saint who got off track. And so it's a great story of restoration, this is. But what else do we see? It says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 23, just a word of encouragement for each one here. What's it say in that verse? He brought us out of Egypt, the picture of sin, Egypt picture the world and all its glory, its strength, its resources, its riches, all the things that people desire to have in life. God led his people away from that. And he brought us out with this wonderful promise in that portion, Deuteronomy 6, 23. 23. He brought us out that he might bring us in. Bring us in to the land flowing with milk and honey. The land of inheritance where the first ripe grapes of the year required two guys to carry it. That's how fruitful the land was. That's what God wants in your life. That's what he wants in my life. He doesn't want the five and dime type of experience. He wants, listen, I'm not charismatic. He wants us to have life and life more abundantly. He's given us that desire in our hearts. And so we should follow through. Satan is there to try to block the way but he's a defeated foe. And so we move forward in the strength of the Lord with God's help, 
with his work in our hearts. God it works in you both the will and do of his good pleasure, working you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. But we come before him asking for his help. And so the angel of the Lord is there to rebuke this work of the enemy. Fourth one, real briefly, the angel standing to restore. And that's what takes place, the restoration. We see that in verse four of this portion. Look with me there at verse four. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him. Another group standing there. Take away the filthy garments. Then see, I've removed your iniquity. I'll clothe you with rich robes. All those wonderful things like the picture of first Kings chapter 10 with the queen of Sheba coming to this great kingdom of Solomon. She comes from a great distance, spends all those resources, the finances to travel this great journey across the wilderness. She gets to the kingdom of Solomon and it says there in verse four, it says when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, it's a picture of Christ and the house that he built, that's the, we might call the person and work of Solomon, like the person and work of Christ. And what does he, she notice? This is what she notices. When she comes there, what struck her was this, the food on the table. The wealth of food on the table. He was a king who taught, taught and treated his subjects well. The food on their table. And the seating of his servants in perfect order. And the service of their waiters, of his waiters. How diligent they were and respectful and desirous to please their king. That's the the service of the waiters and their apparel, their clothing and how they dress to represent their king. She saw those things and the entryway or the ascent by which Solomon went up to the house of the Lord. She said it was so much, so wonderful. There was no more spirit in her. And she goes off in a wonderful portion. How blessed are these your servants who stand continually before you. Uh, wonderful explanation of the glories of this great king, Solomon. And we have a greater king than Solomon, the Lord Jesus. A greater than David, a greater than Jonah, a greater than Solomon is our savior, the Lord Jesus. And he treats his subjects well. All his subjects he treats so well and so good. The food at his table, our spiritual food and everything else, the fellowship and the love of God's people and all the rest, the fellowship of his people and the church. Wonderful thing that we see. Luke 15, 22, bring out the best robe to the prodigal son, put on him and uh, put it on him and put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, bring here the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. That's the forgiving father for the prodigal son that has come back. The great story of redemption. And so the angel is standing by. Finally, and we see it also in the uh, armor of God that is uh, put on for the believer as well. Very much dressed for battle, dressed as well because of relationship with their king. Peter and John Mark, great examples of restoration that take place as well. Finally, in the last minute or so that remains, the angel of the Lord standing to reward. That's the last one we want to look at. Verse five, look with me at that verse. He said, I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head. They put the clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, if, if you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts. And I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Another company of people, the angel of the Lord standing to reward and the companions of Joshua who are there standing and then later on in the next verse sitting. And they're there to acknowledge and confirm the fact that the angel of the Lord is there to reward, standing there to reward. First Samuel reminds us of these words. Those who honor me, I will honor. Young people take that of note. All of us take note. Those who honor me, I will honor. 
First Kings chapter 10 tells us not one word of God falls to the ground. Promises that God, they do not fall to the ground. Every one of them is fulfilled. So God says, you honor me, I will honor you. And it's the reminder of the reward. The angel of the Lord here is standing to reward and remind us of the, the blessings that he gives us. By obedience to him, if you walk in my ways, if you keep my command, then you will also judge my house. Likewise, have charge of my courts, and I will give you places to stand here. What's it say in 2 Timothy chapter 2? If any man, if any woman, cleanse himself of the latter, cleanse themselves of things that are not pleasing to the Lord, and back on track with the Lord, he will be a vessel unto honor, Useful for the master, King James, I love it, fit for the master's use. Fit for the master's use. Channel is only blessed master, but with all thy love and power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. I'm not here to give you a nice little outline. You go off and say, that's nice, nice outline. Makes a lot of sense. Not wisdom of words here. Just easy reminders that God wants you. He, want, he says to you, men, my son, give me thine heart. To any woman here, give me thine heart. If he's got your heart, he's got everything else. That's what God wants. Wonderful picture here of redemption and release, as the hymn says of restoration, of regeneration, of usefulness for the Lord, of the way that God in his mercy and grace makes it possible for us to come back to him and be useful in our service for Christ. Don't let the words drop to the ground. That's one of the things with Samuel. He didn't let any of the words drop to the ground. Don't let those words drop either. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, again, for the ministry of your precious word, your living word, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Father, we thank you for the reminders from Genesis in our previous message. Your restoring work in this message, Father, not our words, but the scriptures is what makes the difference. We pray, Father, your spirit will seal these words to our hearts tonight. Remind us of the mercy and grace of our loving Savior, his goodness, his kindness, his tender mercies. A man of Calvary who gave himself for me. Father, how thankful we are for our precious Savior. Unto you who believe, he is precious. Father, indeed he is. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for your good hand upon us. Take us to our homes in safety, Father. We go in, from this place, indeed, rejoicing because of what your work has accomplished in our hearts and may accomplish even tonight. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.